Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to this session on unintended consequences of scientific reforms at MetaScience 2021. I'm really excited for this panel here. Um, this is my excited face. This is, uh, this is the best <laughs> I can do. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and to be able to facilitate this discussion with Noah um, and to uh, hopefully hear some questions from your end as well. So first, just a brief introduction. So uh, my name is Leo Tiohan. I'm a postdoc currently at the Eindhoven University of Technology, where I uh, work on a BD grant in order to study how to improve the efficiency and reliability of science, uh, mostly studying how incentives affect scientist behavior. And my background is a bit different. My PhD is in uh, evolutionary anthropology. And that was in a past life. Um, and uh, I am co-moderating this panel with Noah, Noah Van Dongen. Hi, I am uh, Noah Van Dongen. I, uh, I'm focused on uh, or interested in informative tests and scientific explanation. I am uh, currently doing a postdoc at the uh, University of Amsterdam with Danny Borsboom, working on the theory construction methodology. I have a background in philosophy of science. I have a PhD in philosophy of science and a PhD in uh, experimental aesthetics. Um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's perfect, perfect introduction. So before we introduced our esteemed panel members today, um, we just wanted to give you a sense for why we thought this would be an interesting panel to have, um, why this topic is interesting. So, you know, Noah and I, you know, discussed this and we all, we all share kind of a few, um, you know, core reasons why we thought this was interesting. So both Noah and I have, you know, read some literatures in, in other fields, you know, science is a broad field, but, you know, through many fields in the social sciences and have slowly, you know, realized just how hard it is to anticipate the consequences of um, changes to any system, you know, let alone one as complicated as science. So, um, you know, even in very simple situations like, you know, introducing a fine in a daycare center to try and prevent people from showing up late. Um, you know, I, many of you might know this uh, uh, um, paper, um, a fine is a price, I believe is the name, where people introduce this fine in order to prevent parents from showing up late and even more parents show up late because basically before parents felt guilty uh, for coming late uh, to pick up their kids and after that they could just pay the fine and sort of buy off their guilt. So. This is just one example of, uh, of how people can, you can crowd out certain types of incentives with financial um, incentives. And so even in a system like that, you can get sort of unintended consequences. And we know that in, in the past, you know, past reforms to try and you know, standardize how we evaluate scientists and measure things like the impact of their work by the impact of the journals that people publish in or by counting publications, you know, those were reforms at some point and now people are gaming them and now we're all complaining about these reforms and we want to change the system again and so um and you know me personally also in my own research uh, i've i've built some models of the scientific process and um, have found results that make sense but that completely were unanticipated like the fact that in some cases rewarding negative results can actually harm the reliability of science because people just are incentivized to conduct really bad low quality studies so so because of these sort of convergent sources of, of things, we've been a bit worried that, you know, as great as it is that we are all pushing for reforms and we're discussing these things and there's a lot of excitement that we also, you know, want to learn from past mistakes and learn from other fields about how we can prevent uh, and potentially anticipate the unintended consequences of our interventions. And so we wanted to put together this session with diverse uh, panelists from diverse fields who have had expertise, uh, both being involved in the scientific reform movement and thinking about interventions to systems to be able to see, okay, what are the gaps and opportunities in this domain? And the goal of this session is of course, to have a nice fun discussion, um, to learn some things, but potentially also later to have a, a, a report, um, a report or potentially a, a paper, but that's, that's um, that's way down the line. We just want to have a fun discussion and learn some stuff. So please, for the audience, if you have questions, feel free to write those in the chat and we will do our best to incorporate some of those throughout the session. 
And that's all I have. And now uh, Noah will introduce our esteemed panel. Okay. So um, in no particular order, we have uh, uh, Professor Danny Borsboom is a professor of psychology department of the University of Amsterdam. According to his website that I uh, just uh, that I read only a few minutes ago, his research focused on conceptual analysis of psychometric concepts, the development of new psychometric techniques, and uh, more recently, the formation of formalized psychological theory. Next, we have our esteemed Anna Dreber, uh, Johan, uh, Johan Jorkman Professor of Economics at the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, she mainly focuses on meta science and behavioral and experimental economics. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Sophia Cruel, a PhD student in philosophy at, uh, um, um, at the University of Cambridge. Her research revolves around replication crisis in psychology, and she also works uh, on empirical meta research at Metric Berlin. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Karthik Panchinathan, associate professor at the, in uh, the Department of Anthropology. Uh, Anthropology at the University of Missouri. His uh, research interests include the evolution of cooperation, culture evolution, and the evolution of development. So why did we uh, invite these people? Um, well, after careful consideration, we uh, invited this diverse group of scholars because they have been involved in the scientific reform movement and had a, have a experienced reasoning uh, about and through consequences of intervening in complex systems. Um, I guess that's it, right? So that is, um, that is it for our scripted for our scripted introduction. Yeah. Yes. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you. So we wanted to start by asking just an open question to the panel about, you know, your experiences with thinking about unintended consequences. So whether some of you can maybe share some either personal experiences you've had with unintended consequences of scientific reform, or even if you haven't had a personal experience with it, unintended consequences that you worry about and you know why you worry about them and, and um, how you see things playing out. And so if any of you would like to, to share um, and start off the discussion, then you are free, you're free. The, the discussion is yours. Sure, Karthik. Uh, I can start with an anecdote, um, which I think is uh, relevant to what we're talking about. One of the one of the core ideas of some of these reforms are uh, increases in transparency and attempts at reducing uh, so-called strategic ambiguity. Uh, Leo and I had an experience a little less than a year ago. Uh, I think it was a year, maybe it was a year and a half ago. I can't now remember in which we um, were ready to submit a paper on meta science in particular on applying uh, costly signaling theory from economics and biology to the publication process, peer review process in particular. Uh, and Leo, um, a good thing, posts his paper on an archive and advertises it on social media. We get some great feedback, including a comment from Carl Bergstrom, an evolutionary biologist who points out some very obscure papers from economics in the early 2000s. Leo, and uh, being a good scholar, decides to rewrite the introduction and mentions this research, which we didn't know about. Not exactly what we were talking about, but certainly related. We submit the paper. The editor, who was a psychologist, probably would certainly would not have known about this research, but because we flagged it, she sent it to an economist who read it and said, this is a really good paper, but I don't care about psychology. We already know this in economics. And one of the comments we made was journals overemphasizing novel results. As a result of this comedy of errors, the editor rejected the paper on the grounds that it wasn't sufficiently novel, even though nobody in psychology knew this, but a few economists did. A good example of a very unintended consequence for something like transparency backfiring. So I, that I, not any big reform, but an interesting anecdote, I thought. Yeah, that was not fun. I, I also have an anecdote of we're starting with anecdotes. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I was involved with EJ Wagemakers in a paper that uh, emphasized um, um, confirmatory research strategies and argued that you should have uh, pre-registration in cases you you're, you're, you have a theory that you actually want to test. And actually, I was sort of expecting or hoping that this would lead to a situation in which uh, psychologists, in which the field in which I operate, 
would acknowledge that, say, 90, uh, 99% of their research is, in fact, explorative. Um, do you still see me? I'm, I yeah, saw, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that, of course, that didn't happen. And what happened instead is that now suddenly, you know, almost all research or everybody has the idea that research has to be hypothesis testing. And that uh, went so far that that's one time I had a, a student group and uh, we were doing a research practical. And uh, at one point, and they had been, uh, they, they are now trained, you know, in openness and transparency and uh, very good. Uh, but uh, we were talking about a research project and they, at some point they said, well, uh, what are our, our hypotheses? And I said, well, uh, you're free, of course, to think about what you would expect to see given what you know, but I don't personally have a strong idea of what I expect to find. And then one student said to the other, a supervisor without a hypothesis, they already warned us for this. And, you know, um, the funny thing about this is that this is a typical thing of backfiring, I think, uh, because what's intended to be a, pretty much a technical methodological addition that applies in the case that you have a really well-formed theory and you want to test it is transformed into to a sort of, sort of universally normative moral imperative that if you don't adhere to that, you're a bad scientist or even a bad person and uh i think that's that's yeah that's that really shocked me shocked me a little bit that it's that things can take on this very normative moral character that's uh so that's that's what i worry about so it's an unintended consequence of how we advocate for these science reforms right because i guess the the problem there is that these students probably works. Yeah, they, I mean, someone someone explained um, these concepts to them in a, in a straight in, in a way that they thought was straightforward and explained it to them clearly. And then it kind of morphed into something that creates this false sense of security and understanding. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was actually a, a good uh, educational experience because, of course, you know, I was taken aback a little bit, but then I explained you know, how I think about explorative research and that it's really important. And uh, uh, so it was a good educational experience. And I also don't think they were taught badly or anything like that. It's just that these rules can easily translate into universals. And yeah, no, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't going to imply that they were taught badly. I just, I mean, I, I just think that there's, there's this tension where we want to be, like, obviously, like, you, you want to have enough nuance for, for, you know, for things to make it make sense, but you also have to have to make things straightforward and you have to make things easily applicable um, because otherwise there's not going to be much uptake, right? Um, of these reforms. Um, yeah, can I actually, I, yeah, I, I will also say what I worry about uh, if that's yeah, not too weird a transition, yeah. very smooth. Um, so I guess um, I, what I really what I worry about a lot is uh, these unintended consequences of um, implementing these reforms in a way that probably works best for um, established researchers at rich universities, um, so equity issues um, in at least two forms. So one in the uh, smaller form of um, ECR, like sort of how, how, this, how this affects ECRs um, and like what do, we, you know, what do we do in that transition period where grad students um, who adopt reforms relatively early are then kind of not, a, not don't really fit into the system that gets them the next job. Um, you know, will this reform just, this reform will just die out. And then in the larger sense of, um, of, of how maybe the way that we were implementing this is um, made for these established researchers at rich universities, uh, the, the, the bigger problem of creating more work and a bigger financial burden um, that might not be, or that definitely can't be um, taken on by, by researchers from all universities and all countries, um, and thereby sort of further reinforcing that those um, uh, in, yeah, inequity issues. Um, Do you think there's some types of reforms in particular that are... Well, at least, I mean, so, it's, so I don't think this is a problem of the reforms themselves. I think it's the way that we've chosen to implement these reforms, right? Because like sometimes I think it's sort of the, 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 the easier road is to just to go with the journals that we already have and create these green open access things that will still feed the, the current publishing system, because, you know, that, that, that way we don't have to burn it all down. 
uh, but um, we, you know, but we, we still, we still can still kind of um, uh, get get to where we want to go, um, to go. But that only works in a system where you can, where, you know, where some of your university or your uh, your grant can can pay for that. Um, because I, I don't think it's right. So I don't think these are necessarily inherent inherent to the to the reforms um, to you know to, to wanting open access publishing or to um, wanting people to put their data online or, whatever, or to uh, want wanting to, to increase their sample size or whatever. I think probably there are ways of of doing it differently. It's just that it's kind yeah, of created by by a certain like the at least the, the first steps of these solutions are created by. A, particular group of people probably. So this thing about equity, so something that's been raised quite a lot when I've been uh, talking to economists is that experimental economists are worrying about uh, uh, that it's being unfair when you have to do larger studies, have higher statistical power, and that then only rich labs can do studies. And now we're talking about labs in the US raising this point. So you can imagine that uh, many other people are more worried about this. And that's, of course, sort of make it more unfair is not something we're after but at the same time we don't want a bunch of low powered studies that don't really uh, say much either so I, I guess more team science and that's easier said than done everyone's was pushing for it and we all like it but how do you reward it to a larger extent and related to what Sophia was saying I'm worrying about worried about uh, that we're sort of right now weeding out some of the junior people who are uh, doing their best to do reliable science because now we're really in a, in a situation at least in economics where most people are continuing with business as usual so there haven't been that much sort of consequences of any reform on them but for some people who have reacted they're doing better I mean they're doing pre-analysis plans that they're sticking to they're getting no results and it, they're even getting a harder time on the job market so I was telling my colleagues in my econ department like next year when we hire uh, when we interview job candidates, let's only go for those with no results and show that we're serious about uh, what we're after. And then some a colleague said like, but there is no point. I mean, if you have a no result, we won't see that paper in economics. The person won't write it up. So of course they won't go on the job market with that. So we'll miss these people we're interested in even by doing that. So what do we do? Uh, and so I find that problematic. Actually, just today, uh, my colleague Han van der Maask walked into my office and said, in response to this same concern, that we should have an N factor in 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 addition to the H factor, and with the N factor should be the proportion of no results you find, and if that's if that factor is too low, then uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a joke, of course, but. <laughs> But it's a good one in terms of well, what do you do? You, you know, Anna or Danny, anyone who's, who's commented on this, do you do you see like solutions to this? Like, what, what do we do with the, the issue that young people who are adopting these reforms are sort of selected against because the prevailing system is rewarding different types of things? Have you experienced people who have managed to succeed otherwise, or you know? I think I think I'm living in a relatively easy field. Uh, now, not when I was starting this, but uh, now it's if for for methodologists with an open science signature, it's 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 not so difficult. And in psychology, of course, there's a lot of momentum now. But I imagine that in economics, for instance, that might be different. I'm I'm not very well versed in economics, uh, but we in psychology, I think, uh, can really start putting this on the agenda for hiring policies. You know, so uh, there's a lot of talk also in the Netherlands, but also internationally, I think, about you know, re-evaluating the criteria that we use to uh, uh, evaluate job applicants. And this guy could certainly be, be, be should be added, actually. So... Um, yeah, but, but are we going to... Like, oh. No, but if, if, those, if those are added, uh, are we going to make those necessary things or just a nice addition and if you have the right papers published in the right journals then you don't have to worry about it yeah well that's i'm i'm not i'm not an administrator i'm i'm not sure about that i think I, this is an interesting one for unintended consequences because if you make it mandatory then you're gonna get unintended consequences and if you don't make it mandatory as well so uh yeah 
Yeah. But uh, yeah, how did your colleagues re re react to this? Yeah, open washing, sorry. Sorry, Sophia. Oh no, sorry, no. I was just going to re like replying to Denny's point of the unintended consequences. Say you're going to get so sort of open washing if if you make it uh, mandatory. But yeah. somehow that 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 to me seems uh, more desirable than um, putting in a policy that at the end of the day, you know, doesn't m might help someone who uh, or like the, you know this requirement might help someone who uh, who can fulfill it, but won't hurt anyone who who doesn't bother trying to fill it. So since we have such a diverse panel, I'm wondering whether, you know, you've seen some reforms that have developed in certain fields that have been adopted in your field or where people have tried to adopt them and you've seen any problems with that um, or had any personal experience? <laughs> okay, Anna. Yes, so I mean, I, I of course love the pre-analysis revolution and I think it's fantastic uh, what's happening. So at this, around the same time as that was happening in psychology, there was also pre-registration in economics. And that typically means something very different. That's basically that you, at some point when you do a study, uh, even after the study, once you've written up the results and everything, register it at the American Economic Association's registry and you get the number which you use when you later submit the paper. That's a very different thing from having a pre-analysis plan and some OSF stamp or, what, or something else, right? So when we started realizing in economics that pre-analysis plans were happening in psychology, some people were super excited and started writing them. Others started sort of continuing registering their things at the AEA with very vague hypothesis, uh, no, test, no information about tests or samples or anything basically. And everyone is getting the same registration type of number which becomes completely meaningless. Uh, so now if I see an AEA registration number, I can't infer anything whatsoever about whether there is a pre-analysis plan that people are trying to stick to or anything. So, but many other people I think are a little bit uh, confused by this and pay attention to this number as if, like that, that's a good signal of quality. So I think that's pretty problematic uh, that we're not, we haven't reached uh, like a good equilibrium anyway. Uh, we're not near anything good at this point. So some confusion, I guess, when we move from fields and try to learn from each other. Have you realized this? Have you seen any of that or no? Other panelists? I don't know, we earlier we discussed, so this gets at, you know, some of the potential unintended consequences of adopting pre-registration. Um, and have you had other experiences either with adopting, you know, other reforms that have gone wrong in anthropology or in philosophy um, or other things that you worry about with pre-registration um, in terms of ways that it might get misinterpreted, ways that people might game it. Um, maybe you've had experience gaming it that you can share with us. Yeah, Karthik, please. Uh, not specifically pre-registration, but I think one of the uh, uh, one of the fears, I suppose, I have is uh, in thinking about you know anthropologists, how anthropologists have studied cultural change, in particular transmission of cultural ideas from one group to another. Um, any culture, and science is a culture, and different disciplines have their own cultures. Uh, there's a host of things that make up that culture, some of which are very modular and can be easily exported, other, and some of which are very salient, but other aspects of the culture that are deeply embedded and tied in with a whole bunch of other practices and norms and institutions, some that are very opaque and invisible. Um, and so one of the fears is that you end up adopting the easily exported and salient features without really understanding how they're causally related to other norms and habits and institutions. Um, since we were talking about anecdotes, um, the anecdote that I sometimes talk to my students about this is uh, so-called cargo cults that arose around uh, World War II in which the Americans in defeating the Japanese and conquering islands in the South Pacific would clear fields, land planes um, as part of the war effort 
the indigenous peoples didn't really understand anything about how planes worked, but they did see interesting cargo coming out of them. And what they observed was if you clear a runway and start doing a particular kind of dance, planes will land and cargo will emerge. Uh, and so lo and behold, they start these cargo cults started forming in which the indigenous peoples would do all of these surface level features that were easy to observe with the expectation that airplanes would land and give them cargo. And of course it never happened. Um, and you know, Richard Feynman back in 1974 actually worried about exactly this problem in coining the term cargo cult science in which he was contrasting his own field, his cherished field of physics. And I think he was picking mostly on psychology but other disciplines as well, where a lot of the trappings of science are, are borrowed but not the core kind of scientific methodology. And the, the broader point is it's very difficult, I think, to know all of the aspects that make a particular practice work. So that, that was just a thought that I had. I'm curious to know what others think about that. Uh, this is a really common worry for me. So I, I tend to, you know, I, I, I taught a lot of research methods and the, you know, the scientific method and all that. And the line is always in psychology that, you know, what makes research scientific is that you follow a rigorous methodology, et cetera. But, you know, following a rigorous methodology can also be itself a ritual. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you pre-register a dumb idea, it's still a dumb idea, right? So, uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't get necessarily better by adhering to a set of practices. And uh, so, yeah, that's in my field in psychology, I often actually am a little bit worried that the emphasis on methodological rigor may also uh, serve a little bit as a cover-up for the fact that sometimes we don't have very good theoretical ideas on, on how things work. And yeah, so, so, you know, so, so that's a different level, of course, of cargo cults, but yeah, it's a worry I often have. It's hard to tell, right? If you're in a cargo cult, you wouldn't know. You know, from the outside, you can see. But if you're in that indigenous tribe, it makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, so you wouldn't know. That, that makes it difficult. Is this what you were thinking about when you wrote the theoretical amnesia piece? That yeah, well, it's, it was was one thing, of course, because, yeah, you know, you're you're really not sure it's not about you, you know, and that's that holds for a lot of these things. Uh, yeah, we have no outside vantage point often, so um, you you really don't know unless, of course, you have technology to prove it, right? That's of course the big thing that say the physicists have, you know, you you built an atomic bomb, okay, you know. That's, but we don't, I don't think we have something like that in psychology. You know, a manifest proof that what we are doing may, really makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of unquestionably in your face, correct. I think most fields have that. I don't know about the other fields here, but uh, I guess the economists and the anthropologists also have uh, some of this. But we have this problem much worse than anybody else because um, there's a there's a very famous uh, uh, set of ethnographies that is often taught. Um, this is one of the challenges, at least in principle with psychology, you can design an experiment and test it again. Uh, even if the theory is bad, you can at least replicate it. Um, one of the earlier ethnographies from the 20th century went to a small village. Robert Redfield went to a small village in Mexico, in rural Mexico and cataloged all the wonderful ways in which these people were cooperative and unlike the people in Mexico City. Some about 15 years later, a generation later, Oscar Lewis went to the exact same village and reached the exact opposite conclusion. And from that, his study of that same village, he coined the famous expression, a culture of poverty and talked about how much richer social life was in big cities and urban areas compared to rural areas. And it's not clear what to make of those two ethnographies other than to teach them and the dangers and difficulties of, of doing science when, when you have so many variables at work. So how do you think this ties into the idea of, you know, incentivizing replications and making sure work is replicable and things like this?
So do you see any, do you see, so you mentioned, you know, the, yeah, go ahead, Karthik. Sorry, Leo, go ahead. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, I was thinking, so there's this, this, you know, you brought this up about the result being non-replicable, right? But then you don't know it's non -rep why it's non-replicable. And so do you see, uh, um, do you see the increase, one of the biggest increased emphases now is on rewarding replications, right? Um, so do you, are there other are thing, things related to that that you worry about, um, you know, Anna, Denny, Sophia? about this this you know increase in incentivization now of this thing that before you know we were very happy now to have a place for people to publish replications but do you worry that it's going to yeah potentially have any sort of side effects or or maybe things we're not anticipating right now so maybe sort of i mean an intended consequence of the replication movement and all these replications, of course, that we increase the re reliability of experimental research. I mean, so most of this has been for experiments. So an another anecdote maybe, but <laughs> so working in economics, when the, the replication crisis hit psychology, lots of economists were saying like, oh yes, the psychologists, they have a problem. Then we started doing replication and many people have done replications, of course, in economics, but we, we did a systematic replication project for experimental economics, which showed some problems too. And then many of our colleagues were like, okay, you, yeah, you guys who are doing experiments, you have problem. So it's sort of, it's good that we realize we have problems, but now we want the rest to realize they have problems too. And that's easier said than done when you're working in so-called natural experiments and regression discontinuities and instrumental variables. and other things that sort of, I can't redo that natural experiment that someone did at uh, some policy level somewhere. Um, I can barely get the data and actually look at it. So sort of, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's unfortunate if everyone thinks that we have problems when we're trying to do good things and improve things and the rest of the world keeps continuing as, as business as usual sort of. One other thought that I have following up on what Anna's point is, one fear potentially is um, uh, replications are fantastic when they can be done, but the danger, one potential downside is we discount research that can't be in principle replicated easily. Uh, and that could feed back to what Denny said is in many cases, these field studies, these observational studies, these natural experiments are the grist for hypothesis generation. You know, when you do the, easy to replicate experiment, that's often the tail end of the research project where you've already have a lot of background knowledge on a phenomenon. But then it, this comes back to the idea of everything must be a confirmation rather than an exploration. Uh, if we overemphasize replications, then things that can't be replicated don't count. Potentially. I, I completely agree with this. Uh... Although I have to say, uh, just maybe as just an intermediate, we're now talking about fears and dangers and horrors, but I'm generally very, very happy and optimistic. And I think it's a tremendous improvement over, you know, like 10 or 15 years ago, uh, at least in our field. So uh, that's really nice. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, that that needs to be said as well, because otherwise it can seem as if we're sort of like gloomily, uh, at this but um uh the, the 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 tail end part i think is really important that most of the techniques because there are techniques right pre-registration uh data archivation uh, replication they're methodological strategies and they are are almost all of these strategies really apply to the confirmatory part you know where you have a really strong theory and it's really a critical experiment and you know the whole popper pop pop story basically that's that's where it applies but you know in, in my view my field is you know by and large some areas you know maybe are are, are are exceptions but by and large the field isn't there so it's much more about you know uh tr transparency of 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 the 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 process that you uh you follow to say do your ethnography or to yeah, just uh, 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 do your explorative research, but that's not obvious how you uh, how you do that. So I don't know uh, whether that makes sense, but yeah. 
Yeah, I think the problem might be that we often end up um, framing these reforms in a way where like, okay, this is about eliminating bias, um, for example, when probably it's much more about making, but I mean, obviously, ideally also eliminating bias maybe, but um, but just just making transparent what's happening so that bias can be eliminated if it's if it's there and can be eliminated. Um, or, and yeah, but, but the problem is that, yeah, it's kind of, it's gone too much in that direction where it's like, hey, we want to get rid of it. Whereas um, sometimes it's also fine to just make it transparent and um, and that that probably would also then be more inclusive of um, of research where yeah maybe you just can't make it uh, you can't kind of completely erase erase all bias biases but um, by making transparent what's happening you can at least give the reader the context that they need um, so I think like that's I mean. This is kind of this, this is something that I definitely worry about as well from the, when it comes to the, the way that um, we talk in in this whole reform movement thing, where like uh, it 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 kind of seems like we're uh, we've got this idea that oh you know if we if we do all of these things if we do A B and B and C and um, if everyone do does that then we'll all end up being perfect rational agents and we don't have to worry about anything anymore forever and that's just that I don't think that's desirable or possible. Really, I mean, maybe it's desirable as like a goal, as long as we know that that's actually impossible for human beings that aren't gods to <laughs> to do. But maybe we all, maybe still just just think of themselves as gods. Who knows? Is it is the fear that we're trying to turn an art into an algorithm? Is that the is that? No, no, yeah. I don't. I don't think that's the fear. The the, the, the fear is, is is really about this this sort of uh, this, this this illusion that we can um, uh, completely get rid of bias. Um, uh, biases rather than um, yeah that, that's the thing that we should focus on rather than just making transparent what what these biases might be um, if you can't completely get rid of them so kind of related to what what Danny was was saying I hope uh, th this this also resonates strongly with me in the sense that for instance yeah I always think that the reason that uh, Francis Bacon the old uh, philosopher guy uh, was so important was that he 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 re was one of the first to realize that we are human and we are a problem. You know, you cannot leave us alone with evidence or data. Everything will go wrong. We need all kinds of checks and balances because we suffer from all of these biases. And, you know, that won't go away. That won't go away. Uh, it's not like if you do open science and transparency, then you don't have this anymore, right? And that's what I sometimes worry a little bit about, that if we only do it like that, you know, then it's then it's OK. But of course, these are just as human projects. Right. And I'm not sure there's enough discussion in the open sciences community about yeah, well, how, 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 how that actually pans out. Well, I sometimes miss that a little bit. The diversity of opinion. But you, take, going okay. back a couple of comments from Kartik, so I mean, a situation where if you have some study where you cannot do a replication for some reason because it is a natural experiment and then uh, people don't care about it anymore, that would be super unfortunate. So that's obviously not a situation where we would want to end up. But I, I would fear that in economics, parts of political science, uh, sociology, like parts where fields where you work with registered data or observational data, it's almost the opposite. Like it, good for you if you have a natural experiment that nobody can try to replicate. Then you're way safer than if you have something where people can actually try to redo the study and see what the result holds. So right now, I think that the situation is really the opposite from what you said. Mm, okay. You're better off having some something that nobody can try to replicate. Right. right. So there's a bunch going on in the chat here that I'm struggling to keep up. So I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to see which there's, question. So there, is, there appears to be a separate discussion going on that that uh, uh, was fueled by Karthik's initial anecdote about uh, the paper you published. So maybe we should should address this briefly to uh, because uh, we might lose a few participants otherwise. Sure. What's been happening uh, with it? No, I'm not sure. I because I, it goes back along. So whether or not it should have been published, uh, where I think it was I think published. We all have to read that paper now. <laughs> it was published. It's Everyone it's fine. It's a good paper. Yeah. It was published in a good journal. Uh, it wasn't published in the original journal. And I think the debate, the question was about you know there were questions about 
whether journals journals should uh, uh, publish things that aren't totally novel. And uh, there was a very interesting comment. And then there was also comments about everything should be published or not. Uh, I mean, that's a whole nother, I think, conversation about the gatekeepers of knowledge and journals and what role they play in all of this. I think I think the drive for novelty is 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 a is something that that really creates a lot of problems. So um, yeah, it's just very hard to write a paper that goes like you know I I I, I went on this research project, and I think it's you know it's not the strongest work I've done or it's not not so interesting. But you know I did my best. This came out of it. I don't know what to make of it. Right. No, oh, that's that, that's not a paper that you can write. In yeah. the, I, I think the other issue with novelty that that in this particular case was was interesting to me and maybe relevant to what we're talking about is I think every science would be much stronger if there was more conversations with and communication with other sciences because different sciences have have hit upon different methods and different techniques uh, and different theories. And it's a good thing when you can port over a theory from one discipline into another. Um, the theory that, that was at the heart of the paper that Leo and I wrote, costly signaling theory, this was uh, well widely known within economics by the early 1970s and three economists shared the Nobel prize over the role of asymmetric information in markets, uh, Stiglitz, uh, Spence and Akerlof. Uh, this was not known in biology and it was independently invented in biology. And it was one of these things where an economist, Jack Hirschleifer tried to point out to biologists, hey guys, what you guys are doing is interesting. We've already thought about a lot of these, you should read the papers and they didn't. Um, and part of the reason there's a strategic reason not to because if they had admitted that they read those papers then suddenly it deflates their own contributions in their field. Right, somehow they're the premium is I came up with this without anybody else having ever thought about it as opposed to, um, oh, I found this really interesting tool over here that I'm going to apply. Um, and so, so I think the novelty in this- But then again, in their defense, uh, it's, it's not really easy for an outsider to read economics papers. Oh uh, no, no, no actually, I don't. I don't. It, I don't. It's sorry. hard actually to read papers from a different field, right? I, I don't disagree with that at all. What I meant was there are strategic reasons. I think, for example, in our case, had we not posted the paper on an archive, we wouldn't have known about it. After we posted it on the archive, we could have still ignored that comment and submitted it as is because the paper was already written, and the editor would have never known. Uh, but by following that. You know, chain of events. Then suddenly, we're penalized for for being transparent, um, admitting that oh, somebody else came up with this idea too. But do you guys see? So I see two directions here. One is the penalization, you know, unintended consequence of being more open. So this is like an unintended consequence for the scientist itself. Yeah. I wonder if you have thoughts about other unintended consequences of openness in general for science because this is really if i think of you know all of the reforms the ones that have you know, proliferated the most have been open sharing of data and materials and and this gets to denny's thing of it being really a normative thing you know if you're not open right. now um you yeah you you're you're seen as a bad person but i add one thing to leo uh, i'm really curious about this but I, one thing i wanted to add to what leo said as a game theorist the way i'm thinking about this is right now it seems to me sometimes there's a frequency dependent problem. If everybody were open and honest and you were penalized for not being, that would be a wonderful world. But right now it is a minority kind of strategy. And so the question is, how do you not penalize people for trying to adopt? This is often the case is that when it's a new strategy, even if it's a better one, it's not gonna do well until the majority adopt it. And so there is this challenge that arises. So, so I think this this has to be solved in an incentives way, in the sense that you publish your data and get credits for it. You know, uh, so I think uh, journals like uh, yeah, you you have the Journal of Open Psychology data now. There's Nature Scientific data. Uh, I think that that's a way in which you can actually incentivize it to be a majority uh, strategy. So that's that's uh, I think that, that but that also has has costs. I think Sophia said something about that earlier, but you know, there's a it's also a lot of work to create databases that are, 
you know, addressable by outsider researchers. And I know a lot of researchers who do that and never get the, their data downloaded. So it's also a, um, yeah, where do you say, yeah, the, there should then also be more reuse or, and, and of these materials. We have the same with pre-registration, right? I think uh, research found that pre-registration often is not really followed up, for instance. Yeah, I mean, then it's just um, a ritual. Anna or um, but, Sophia, have you experienced or do you have worries about, you know, the cost of openness in any way? Yeah. I mean, following up on what Danny just said, um, yeah, I find, I find this, this, this particular worry really tricky because, um, yes, right, so on the, one, on the one hand, you're, you're creating all of this extra work and then the question is, you know, like, Maybe maybe Denny can uh, pay a research assistant to to do that for him, but uh, someone else can't. So that's 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 a problem in itself. But then on the other hand, obviously there's like even if even I, I think that even if no one ever uses that data and if no one ever ha has a, has a look at your pre-registration, I, I do think that having that out there is useful if you if you can can put it out there, right? Um, just that even even just because even just as a sort of as a record of what happened um, and. You know, particularly thinking about um, yeah, the fact that a lot of research actually is done by people who aren't um, permanently employed um, and who, you know, who might move to other places or whatever. Like it's just, it's just a good way of, of making sure that all of this work that is being done actually <laughs> has, a, you know, is, is, is documented some way in a way that, that can be reused, even if it's not reused. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's a tension there, right? Like, so I, I do think that there's an, an inherent value to, to putting this stuff out there. Uh, even if no one ever uses it. But on the other hand, yeah, it is, it is a lot of work that not everyone can afford to, to put in um, and to maybe, yeah. So, so there's also, a, um, sorry. No. So there's a, a question from the, from the audience, from uh, James Smith, um, uh, and he responds to Danny's comment on the, that the, the focus on pre-registration uh, presumably, uh, well, diverts attention from, uh, from other practices for instance, choosing an important research question. And he asks, so should meta science be spending more energy working out what is actually worth investigating? Is this a role for meta science? Isn't that what a philosopher does? <laughs> but he doesn't tell, doesn't tell scientists. So he figures it out for himself and then talks about it to other philosophers, but not the scientists. Do you have a, do, does anybody have a, a, does anybody think meta science should be investigating what's worth investigating? Or do you think that is the role for the substantive scientists? So I think that this is a great question to um, percolate on while we take like a seven minute break so that we can all do whatever it is we need to do during a seven free minutes um, and get our energies back up and then uh, and uh, sprint to the finish line uh, maybe in seven minutes. So. I think we're going to put it on pause for seven minutes and we'll see you back here at um, 10 27 uh, Central European time. See you all soon. See you in a few minutes.
All right. Welcome everyone back. Um, for the audience, so we have about half an hour. So if you have some pressing questions that you want to ask our genius panelists, now is the time to write it in the chat because um, there's been a lot of great discussion and we haven't been able to, uh, there haven't been many too many direct questions. So if you have a direct question right now, we'll we'll do our best to take a few minutes to, to bring it up. And so now they're here, they're all these four people are here. So as long as they're not too embarrassing, I think you can ask uh, almost anything. We'll, we'll, we'll screen these questions before. But, uh, indirect, think, indirect questions are good too. Uh, right. Um, so maybe we should uh, pick this up where we left off, where this uh, the question about should meta science be spending more energy working out what's actually worth investigating. However, um, considering this, this is panel discussion is about unintended consequences. Do you see any intended or unintended consequences when meta science start meddling in what researchers should investigate? Yeah, I, I, so I was involved in the reproducibility project, and um, yeah, but that was an, a more or less people could just you know choose something uh, that they would replicate, and um, that's a model. Uh, you can also regulate what gets replicated through all kinds of indices, uh, and in that way you steer a little bit, you know what 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 does get replicated actually. And uh, I, I, I do think there are at least methodological uh, research that can be done to develop that kind of in this index, you know, research that's very important, very impactful, um, but has not been replicated, must have a higher replication uh, uh, opportunity, for instance, so that that that's kind of thing I do, but I don't think meta scientists should steer psychological research or something like that. You know, directional psychology, but it but it is doing that. How do you see it doing that? Well, yeah, uh, by by, uh, for instance, if you push a lot on 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 studies that we just talked about that are reproducible, you 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 steer the, the discipline in a direction of studies that are reproducible. And uh, as uh, Anna and uh, uh, Karthik, you know, noted, there's a lot of things that re really aren't e really reproducible in the replication, experimental replication sense. So field studies, qualitative work, really, really important, explorative work, uh, but not, not, not so easy. So uh, not so easy to replicate. So that's an example, I think, where, where there's a risk I, I'm not sure this is happening, by the way, but it's a risk that uh, that that you start steering, and then you better, you know, do it consciously. You know, instead of just you know finding out twenty years later, oh shit, we we steered this whole field in this direction without. Really Anna, do, you, do you see any of this steering that you worry about a bit in economics at all? Uh, maybe no, not really. But I hear the fear of <laughs> the theory, so that that's been raised, like in many many experimental economic seminars. That when you have pre-analysis plans, or even more so, registered reports, you steer people to more boring hypotheses and more boring results. Whether that's the case, I guess that's an empirical question. I'm not sure how exactly to measure. How boring hypotheses are tested, but I mean, I'm sure we can figure. Someone can work on that, which is I think interesting. But but that's a, that's obviously a worry for some people, by lots of people, that pre-analysis plans and registration reports lead to more boring, boring hypotheses, more boring papers. We don't discover the world the way we should, basically. And I think part of the reason why people are thinking this is that. They're thinking that if you do a pre-analysis plan, you cannot do any exploratory analysis. And that's, of course, not necessarily the case. I mean, you could have a pre-analysis plan, you just clear what's confirmatory and what's exploratory. So there's been some miscommunication, on, uh, I'm guessing. But in practice, do you see do you see this changing people's behavior in terms of actually pushing them more towards doing a bit less exploration because they have a plan, for example? 
Yes, I think people are doing, I mean, at least the papers that I read and see, I think people are doing less exploratory tests than they used to. Uh, and that's not only bad, because uh, you could do many of them without reporting on them. And hopefully people are reporting. I mean, you, this crowd, know, you know what I talk about here. But um, no, so I think sort of, but the misperception that this is the case is blocking maybe some people from embracing pre-analysis plans more. So I think that's a problem. But I, I'm not sure, do you think that sort of the re registered reports and pre-analysis plans have led people to test different things more than sort of whether they replicate? But in, if you are in the world of experiments where you typically can replicate things, do you think people are testing other types of hypotheses, like high, more high probability hypothesis? Probably, yes. But are they necessarily more boring? I, I would actually say that's not necessarily a problem. I love boring hypotheses. Uh, I love actually things that are really robust. Uh, and in psychology, we have a lot of experience with, you know, really, really cool things. So I'm, yeah, I have the beer rule. And the beer rule is if there's a finding in psychology that I can talk about on a party and people start getting me beers to keep me talking, then it's probably not true. <laughs> uh, you know, if it's if it's interesting and it sounds good etc so i i'm all for more boring hypotheses but what what i worry more about is so in my field in psychology there is in my view a yeah very little attention to qualitative work for instance interviews oh Nice, that's a, that's a beautiful <laughs> You know, you need examples to teach it. And what are the examples? So what you see, then you need to sort of, there are always, you know, experiments. So you create a, um, yeah, you create a bit of a mold, right? Because all your prototypical examples, your exemplars, as Kuhn would, would call them, are these, these things so that's that's more what i worry about so we uh, address a question from the audience yeah definitely now, can i uh, ask a question that somebody from the audience asked that i think is a good one um, oh okay, sure Go ahead. Uh, uh, there was the comment from didier i hope i'm pronouncing this right tourney um that there's some irony in talking about not seeing what's been done before elsewhere in a meta-science conference as the field is almost completely ignored 40 years of science and technology studies. Um, so, you know, so I guess the question that I'm curious about is, I don't know the answer to this because I'm not very good about this kind of research, but in the same way that when the replication crisis suddenly emerged, people started realizing, wait, people like Paul Meal have been talking about this forever. Um, what are we doing that's new? So I guess the question is, you know, how much, how much ground, uh, you know, in these sort of conversations have, have already happened? I, I have no idea. Are we as meta scientists like the first people to ever think of these these you know we need to be clear about the distinction between confirmatory science and exploratory science so i think i think, I think my eighth grade science teacher would be quite upset with that I, I think this is a good question because it gets at a bit a bit like what we can learn from what has been done in the past or from other disciplines i think this also gets at one of the goals of this panel which we will try to achieve in the next 20 minutes about how we can how we can anticipate these things so do we have any tools you know how can we draw on things from other disciplines or whatever other tools we have to try and you know mit either mitigate some of these consequences or try and try and be you know not completely kind of walking blind right and and hoping that maybe then 20 years down the line we'll figure something out so um i would love to hear um sophia anna denny I think if you if you think if you had to pick one tool that you're like okay if we have to address this problem you know I would go for this um, you know not that not as the only tool but like as something that you think would be a promising way to to um, try and anticipate some of these things. One thing that I'd really like to see um, is I think one of the issues is an overemphasis on specialization uh, and especially if we're interested in interdisciplinary science I'd love to see a mechanism by which for example, I'm just thinking out loud, graduate students in psychology, let's say, 
there was some way in which they could do internships in, in related disciplines or in other disciplines. And you know, if we intentionally created more of these bridges across disciplines, then a lot of the, the you know, what's known elsewhere would there be there be ways of connecting these things up, but also you, you you'd come to understand your practice a little bit better because that would address one of Denny's earlier points is you would have a view from the outside. Everybody would have a view from from some particular outside. So I, I don't know some way in which we could uh, uh, foster more um, kind of. I, I know like within our psychology department here at Missouri, I think the students will spend time working in labs other than their advisor's lab, but they're all within their subdiscipline of psychology, which doesn't really address the issue. So that, that was one thought that I had. So why do you think that would, that would help? To see how other disciplines do science, to start thinking more carefully about your own in the same way. One of the key lessons in anthropology that, that we teach about ethnography is part of the purpose of doing anthropology is not to discover some exotic and not to make some, you know, sort of exotic culture familiar to you, but to make your own familiar culture exotic to you, where you start to ask different questions about your own practices because you've seen how things are done differently. I, I think that's a great idea. Good luck actually doing it. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. I, th I think uh, I would I love think... to intern in your lab, Denny. Fly me out to okay. Amsterdam, I'll do it. <laughs> Sophia, um, was there anything that resonated with you about the, the question about like, you know, what, what can we do or like things you've done that have helped you to, you know, think about reforms in a different way? Um... Well, I guess uh, sort of uh, related to what, I mean, so we've, we've had this come up a couple of times now when it comes to unintended consequences, uh, both from Denny, for example, talking about um, the, the value of exploratory research and, and Anna talking about um, these pre-analysis plans and um, also the more recent point that you made, which is also kind of like, well, people are kind of misunderstanding what's happening here. Um, so I guess some, I, 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 think, I think something that's quite important is sort of, yeah, Think, thinking about that um, potential between explaining things simply, but also wanting things to actually make sense and be, be coherent and, and nuanced. Um, and yeah, just having having these these very these conceptual discussions um, much more probably than, than, than we are currently having them. Um, I think, I mean, obviously meta science is an empirical um, science, but I think there's a lot more space for, for conceptual discussion, even within that, because um, I mean, Denny has a, has a great anecdote about that. I, I think when it comes to like de defining what a replication is before you actually go into a replication project, um, and uh, right, right. So like this 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 kind of very straightforward stuff. Um, I think I think that would be helpful. Um, probably ties into that question about science and technology studies as well. Um, sure, we we're, we're probably also uh, ignoring certain things there. Someone in the comments made the very good point though that there. So Anna Donhouse made this point. That there's a difference between we are the first ones to think of this and it's widely known and understood so i um yes obviously like just to some extent you should you should you should try, as, as meta scientists um should try to uh to to see literatures that that we don't necessarily see but also i i don't quite understand the anger at meta science um uh, as a as a field because if if scientists came to sort of Came to the conclusion that maybe we need this 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 field because to, to better understand what's happening um then then maybe there was was a disconnect um be, between between the, the, the sort of the field of science and technology studies and um actually changing something uh, or yeah or, or i mean the side and the scientists in order to actually change something but that's as that's already too controversial i think <laughs> and was like five different points in one um, it was but, related to the talk that you gave at Leiden about um, like needing more conceptual clarification to get a sort of, um, you know, I forgot what you called sorry, it. Sorry, I, crisis I couldn't hear. Oh, the crisis of inference thing that you presented at at Leiden? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, this, this is obviously like, this is my sort of little uh, thing that I'm writing right now. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I think I think probably the, 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 the fact that we, um, focus on replication so much has obviously we've seen this led us astray a lot. 
Um, and I think, yeah, I, I, I've made this argument, I'm, I'm trying to make this argument that actually if we see a lot of this more, more as a, being a crisis of inference, um, so being problems in the way that we make inferences, that um, that way we might be able to, to better understand what's what, what's happening here and to to be able to to direct our focus on, on all of these um, different sub crises that are happening, uh, not just replication, but also problems of generalization, sort of over generalization um, and of, of um, the way that we use the method, methods, uh, the theory crisis, all of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think right. it's probably all, all much more com complex than yes life. it is all horribly complex i'm wondering anna as well just give you a chance like i don't know as an economist who also is you know yeah knows about how hard it is to change policy and things like this uh, yeah are there are tools you think we have um you know how can we mitigate some of the stuff or anticipate it so i mean i know very little about policy <laughs> so that's not the type of economist that i am but um so i think that so i i'd like to pick up tom's uh, comment in the or question in the Q&A. So like, should we run trials on reform initiatives before they scale up or would that suppress the momentum of reforms and reduce opportunities for natural experimentation? I think we should do more experiments to the extent we can. In particular, sort of if some people have priors that we yeah, buy pre-analysis plans, you get boring hypotheses, et cetera. Okay, let's, let's sort of get, experiment more with our journals and with their policies and see what does this lead to and many of these sort of concerns are things that we can address in various ways I and mean, we can look at priors in um, etc so i think yes we should i think we should experiment more in particular before sort of uh, we implement things all over the place so I mean, experimentation to, in general, I expect. Right? If you were to pick like one, don't one reform, you know, from the big ones that are being rolled out that you think really, if you had a prediction market and you had to put your money on one reform that, uh, yeah. No, okay, no, that I don't know. But talking about prediction markets, maybe we should add prediction markets as a reviewer, sort of, to, some journals should gather with this or like experiment with this, having instead of just having like a three reviewers to read the paper, okay, the fourth reviewer can be a prediction market and people can bet on the replication outcome or something. And we have a positive probability of all papers being picked for replication and not all of them will be replicated. I think we should like do more stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying prediction markets are a solution to all problems in science, obviously not, but they can play perhaps a tiny role. And if they can, that would be one way to test it. So I'm just saying that there are probably many such small things that we should be testing. So Tom, I think we should do more of experiments uh, to test reforms. I think not you may... necessarily before implementing them, right? So I think I find it. No, I mean, you can implement them somewhere. Yeah, no, right. It's like, no, but it's just if I understood it correctly, I think what, what Tom meant was that, yeah, right. So should we run trials before they're scaled up? And I think especially, I mean, especially for uh, things like registrations of registered reports, probably it does make a lot of sense to to put it out to have it out in the open and to um like not 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 as a not as a small trial but to really see if if it goes wrong on on the big scale because i think we have enough reason to believe that um if if done properly and if understood correctly that uh it has value um to to pre-register and to do, do these registered reports right no so i completely yeah, we, can, we, can, we can still find out that it's wrong for some reason but yeah but we can, I mean, so it can happen somewhere. I mean, we have all these different fields. It's happening a lot in psychology, in medicine, et cetera. One could try to take that to other fields and see uh, what happens if you then sort of randomly allocate pre-registration or not to journals, what happens to results, et cetera. So there, I think psychologists could probably go to many other fields right now and test these things because many other fields are way slower including economics i would say lots of business administration research etc so maybe some low-hanging fruit that could be interesting just going to other fields and saying can i interest you in some con controversies and and things a lot of people will disagree with so no i are there questions or there there was a question yeah, too that you mentioned that. So yeah there's a question from, uh, oh go ahead there's a question from uh, Jeffrey Mobley on uh, changing incentives from uh, from novelty to methodological rigor. Uh, would this um, motivate different uh, people to become researchers, do you think, and would this be a good thing? Yeah, 
you can read the entire question in the Q&A, but um, I'm not going to uh, read it verbatim. So will changing incentive structures change who will become scientists or who will want to become scientists? I don't quite understand the, the question, um, or at least fully. Like, so are they saying, because uh, Jeff Jeff definitely was saying, I think the, don't we I want the smartest is... people possible becoming scientists instead of bankers? So is the assumption here that if we make, if, if we change the incentives that it'll not, it'll be bankers who are coming in or? Um, I'm guessing, like, I mean, maybe it's something like, oh, go ahead, Karthik, yeah. People with different skills, you know, might, you know, so the, the question is to what degree are people in, currently in science, are they plastic in terms of developing to whatever is needed versus people with skills that aren't currently included by, by rewarding different approaches to what might we select in different kinds of people, um, I think. I, th I, I like, think that might be that might actually be a good thing. I mean, you can't. I, I often worry that the way we fund research now is like you 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 assemble a soccer team with with eleven strikers, right? They're all everybody who gets funded has a big you know vision and uh, blah blah. Uh, so it might might balance that a little bit to more yeah more of the checker checker types or critical people and that that would I think be a be a good thing but I'm not sure whether that will actually work because uh, everything anything that involves this kind of hypothesis is very hard to chart but I was I, I wanted to say that in response to Anna that you know if you can see what's going on then everything is hard so so one thing that meta science i think could do is keep track of stuff you know i don't think we currently have like you know uh, uh, i don't have a view of yeah you know how many papers are being pre-registered in which fields uh you know you, you would want a dashboard of sorts of just you know to to to, to be able to understand what you're talking about so that would, I think, be a hugely important thing. And what I also think would be very good if we had, you know, you, you start out when, when we started out in psychology, it was more like activism. You know, any change in this direction was good because it was so bad. But now in psychology, in Holland, in my country, you know, I think it's more or less policy. So it's no longer activism. It's now about, you know, OK, so we've got a policy. How do we evaluate the negative results of that. Do we actually do that? And I think that's also really a role that that you know uh, things like Center for Open Science or or other organizations should maybe push a little bit more for like you know if you get on top and you're actually riding the horse, you know, trying to get on it, then you also have the responsibility to you know. So that's 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 I, something that I often miss. We're about to be demoted. Yeah, I saw okay. that as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if we can probably do one more question and then um, then we can either do a rapid fire of reforms, which will not be good because you only have like a minute to respond to each one or just wrap up. Was there another question that we did, that we didn't address? I know that. Elizabeth Bick had one, but I didn't see what the question was. Daniel Fanelli's question. Yeah. What was it? Daniel's question. Um, that, uh, uh, what do you think uh, of the claim that science has mainly a crisis of theory instead of methodological rigor? Yeah, I think we should skip that. Sorry, Daniel, it's not really about unintended consequences. But it's an interesting, very interesting question. So I guess I would, you know, if I were to wrap up, I think there's so much here. I wish we had, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I wish it wasn't 11 p.m. But, um, but if you were to think of one, you know, one thing that either you would want the audience to take away or just one question you would like the audience to think about, I know it's putting you on the spot with regards to reforms, potential other reforms we should consider or the potential unintended consequences of reforms like in your field or ones you're worried about what what would be the one thing you would want the audience to keep in their mind just in like 15 or 30 seconds maybe i will i think that might be a nice way to wrap up and then um hopefully 
uh, you know, I won't put you on the spot so much that uh, you will have nothing to say. But Karthik, shall we shall we start with you and just hope sure. you can come um, up with something? Yeah, this is a this is something that I do kind of think about: is how much do we are we overemphasizing the role of incentives and and therefore oh, turbocharging self interest and crowding out a whole bunch of other ethical and mo mo you know uh, motivational schemas that uh, so I don't know I, I mean building character rather than feeding self-interest through incentives. I don't know what that means, but that's something that <laughs> you've mentioned it before as well yeah. as like a concern yeah. you've had. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Um on that? I don't know. I don't have any insightful thing to say. <laughs> so go for it. Anyone? There were so many earlier. Okay, we'll we'll skip over you for now. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I have something insightful, but I'll say something. Um, so, I, and, and probably you'll just disagree. So, I think that um, a lot of these unintended consequences that we talked about um, are consequences of the, of the sort of the way that we implement these reforms within the system that we found ourselves in, um, and that is a system that's really quite broken and unfair in lots of different, different ways. And so, reforming it's going to be complex and it's going to make things worse in lots of different ways unintended ways yeah um so i guess my uh, my sort of yeah my question is if if the ways that we implement these reforms in the system that we're in um if if those if those lead to all of these unintended, unintended con sorry, consequences then um yeah are we being radical enough in how we make these reforms um is my question yeah should we should we I mean, not not think sort of further outside of the box, I guess. Um, yeah. Denny, shall you take shall you take us home? I, I want to hear from Leo or Noah as well. We can we can say we can finish after Denny. Yeah. Yeah. Are we being radical enough? That's a that's a nice one. Yeah. So so um, I, I have this thing uh, that uh, I really think much of the open science is predicated on a very limited template of scientific research. And uh, I, I, re I really think, I, I wish there were a good way to report exploratory research without, you know, faking the theory introduction, you know, as if you had an idea or this or that, but just, you know, we had this, we had this data set, we had this model and we, you know, just went ahead and look, this is interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. And I, I, so, so I think that the, the scientific template that we all work in, you know, the thing we write, the paper we write is so uniform and so uh, already encodes so many philosophy of science, basically, about, you know, what research ought to do. And uh, yeah, maybe we're not being radical enough in revising, you know, uh, the, the system as a whole. I mean, if, if it's, if it's transparency and reproducibility or, or, or uh, openness that we value, you know, do we actually go far enough in, in uh, reconsidering what counts as a publication, for instance? You know, what is, what is a openness about if we basically fa force everybody into a, I had this theory and then I made a prediction and then I checked it, a uh, sort of, you know, artificial straitjacket. I mean, I find very often that I, you know, I work in a very open way, but when it comes to writing the paper, it's really hard because the paper format doesn't really allow for, oh, and then I did that analysis. And then I thought, you know, this is a good idea because then the editor will say, hey, that's a hypothesis. It should go in the introduction. That actually happens, right? So, so I think, yeah, maybe also uh, in that spirit, uh, we shouldn't just uh rethink research methods but also you know the whole whole way we re report things and and what we put in there well that was that's my hang up yes I have big this. big food for thought thanks Danny. so noah do we should we end on we have a few minutes you want do you want to say your thing i'll say my thing and we'll wrap up okay. let me see if i have a thing to say um so what i was reminded uh, about was i think it's popper's uh, the free society and his enemies that we should not consider the question who should rule because that's something that is unanswerable. So we should not say, okay, so what is the best scientific reform and try to implement that? 
but figure out ways in which we can, well, try many things and especially see uh, as clearly and as quickly as possible where they go wrong so that we can, well, uh, check our government and eliminate it from power when it fails and give it the, all the opportunity to succeed, but, uh, but remove it as quickly as possible when it starts to build. As I was saying with scientific reform, give it all the opportunity it deserves to, to flourish and kill it, kill it quickly when it fails and try something new. I don't think I can top that, Noah. So uh, I think that's great. Um, yeah, my, my thing, I have a couple of things, but I guess I think we should be more humble. I mean, because science is complicated, you know, it's this crazy complex system and it's hard enough to predict the effects of interventions to little simple systems, you know, um, let alone, let alone something as complicated as science. So I think um, it's fine to have verbal hypotheses that we, you know, are confident in, but I think if you, if we learn enough about how other people have been equally confident in other fields and, you know, just look up, you know, unintended consequences of the Wikipedia page or something of all the ways people have gone wrong in so many different domains, we should be a little more humble. And then we should try and figure out ways we can learn from other fields and the tools other fields use like, yeah, like modeling, the formal theoretical modeling of these things or small, smaller scale experiments of interventions and whatever, making analogies with those existing processes where, you know, and seeing what we can learn from them. So yeah, I think some humility would be good. Um, of course, you don't want to be so humble that you'd never push for anything, but we need to have a balance. We have a minute. So I want to thank uh, all four of our panelists, Sophia Cruel, Denny Borsbaum, Anna Draber, Karthik Benchenathan, and Noah, uh, co-host uh, or whatever. Uh, this was really great. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for the audience for your participation. I wish we could have gotten to all your questions, um, but we're happy to continue the discussion with you later if you're interested in this topic. And thank you to the conference organizers, and um, we wish you all a great rest of the conference. So thank you very much. You.